right, I think we'll go ahead and kick this off. My name is Lauren Brown. I am part of the Blink team, and my role here is to kick off this next session. Um, I hope you all had a lovely lunch. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I've had a lunch like that since I was in Minnesota at my grandma's uh, table. I'm like, mashed potatoes, stew, creamy soup. Like, I'm like, oh. So, keep it, we'll keep things riveting for you, we promise. So, if you um, live in the camp where you believe that uh, tech, uh oh, very, very sorry. <laughs> sure that. If you believe that, uh, Building a better mousetrap from a technology standpoint is table stakes. And that the real challenge that faces us from a design and from a product manager standpoint is how to build a user experience that really engages with the end user. Well, this is, this is a great um, talk for you to be at. Sam specializes in social aspects of technology change. She has breadth and depth of working with both the consumer as well as the enterprise information worker. Um, enterprise information, I believe, going back to the 1990s when she worked at CNET. So, though she's so young, she somehow started working in the 1990s. I haven't figured that out totally yet. Uh, today, uh, Sam is a senior researcher at Microsoft in the OSG group, which is the operator systems group and uh, is here in Redmond, a transplant from Canada. And um, in her spare time, and I say that with um, in a questioning way because I know Sam, I work with her, I know the cadence at which she works, and I don't understand when she ever had free time. <laughs> However, somehow, not only did she write a book, but she actually got it published, she actually published it. So in the last year, her book has come out. Um, it is there, it is for sale in the, uh, at the conference for the next two days. And um, prior to coming to Microsoft, she was um, she ran her own research firm and taught qualitative research at Ryerson University in Toronto. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sam. Thank you, Lauren. That was, that was quite a delight. But <laughs> in case you're interested, I honestly I wrote that on the bus. I did. Really okay, it. now I, it makes sense. I wrote it on the bus. Uh, I commute to work on the bus, so hey, I'm multitasking. Yeah, uh, it's really it's a much better way to enjoy yourself while you're on the bus. <laughs> and productive too. Yeah, it's very productive. So I recommend it. Second book is starting, but my case slightly changed. It's a little... Anyway, the second book is the outline is almost done. Uh, thank you, everyone for uh, joining me today. Um, today I'm going to talk about a concept that will help you uh, design and build better technology. Before I get started, how many people here would identify themselves as designers? Yeah, okay. How many would characterize themselves as researchers? Uh, makers? Okay. Any others that I can get? Developers maybe? No? Okay. Good. Okay, so this is like kind of exactly what I was expecting. Um, this is a, a method, I'm going to talk about a method that you can use to uh, design better technology, but this talk is not a how-to. If you um, leave here with a feeling that you got a step-by-step, -step, I'm actually going to think I failed. Uh, you will get a little bit of a step-by-step, -step, but I don't want you to leave here with that. What I would actually like you to do is uh, I want you to be troubled. I want you to feel uncomfortable. Uh, I want you to remember maybe a moment in your current practice, maybe you'll pinpoint it, when you started to phone it in. Success for me today is for you to bodily experience that moment again. <laughs> to think of that moment when you squirmed, remembering something that you or your colleague did when you were trying to build good technology and totally failed. Um, maybe you're going to, in your mind's eye, you're going to run through that really critical meeting, that terrible meeting, uh, that really went sideways, or maybe you're going to remember that moment where the decision was made, but you only realized it after the fact, and then that was the moment that you realized you really screwed it up. I, I want you to kind of feel that. So you're going to recoil. You're going to recoil from that thought, that memory. <laughs> And you might even leave this talk thinking that everything I've just said is completely impractical, which is kind of 
the opposite of what it is. It's very practical. And when I say practical, like my book, Practical Ethnography, practical is actually a very meaty, theoretical, philosophical concept. It's embedded in everyday life. The objects, the people, all the things that you make and do, you are practically associating with them. The moment you can step back and abstract away, that is impractical, that's theoretical, and you don't want to do that. Um, this is a very practical talk, but it isn't about a checklist. I want you to pinpoint that moment in your own life when you didn't live up to your responsibility as a maker, as a designer, as a researcher, and we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna talk about confronting that. Uh, so, speaking in kind, I think I'll start with telling you a little bit about a moment that I had. Um, I was conducting an ethnographic study for a pharmaceutical company. And the task at hand, the project was to help the company craft better messages, uh, both to its uh, consumer <coughs> patients and to its uh, psychiatrist and uh, uh, physician customers. And they really wanted to understand, the customer, uh, my client, really wanted to understand what it meant to be both a patient and a doctor around this particular set of illnesses. So what I was doing was I was spending time with patients in their homes, and I was spending time with physicians in their offices. And it was an uh, ethnographic study. Can you run in the back? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, an ethnographic study where I spent time in offices with physicians and where uh, allowed and uh, able to, I actually witnessed patient doctor interactions with everybody's consent, of course. Something weird happening. And it was going quite well. I met an Australian doctor who was like so welcoming, I, I overstayed my time there and he insisted I do so. Um, I met another doctor who uh, had done market research before and had never actually felt good about anything that he'd done and he was delighted that he had this opportunity and he felt like it was a therapy session and he thanked us when we left, you know. Um, I had another university-based doctor who was an academic physician and he gamely took me up and down the halls of his hospital and I went to a, a, a foreign expert was in town, he insisted you simply must come to the lecture, and of course I went to the lecture, that was fun, uh, everything was going right. Um, but then, I met one physician who right away I could tell this was going to be a little more different. This is different. He was a bit prickly. Um, and he told me a little bit about this pile here. I asked him about what it was like to be this kind of a physician and what were his major frustrations. And he took me over to this little table that was on the side with this pile of charts. And these charts are his no-shows. These are the people who make appointments and don't show up. And he was very troubled by this. Um, his secretary was very troubled by this. And he was troubled not just because of the practicalities, which is obviously where his secretary was really troubled the most, but also because each and every one of these people represent to him uh, poorer health for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, this is in a Canadian context, so the, it's socialized medicine. So this particular physician, um, he doesn't charge directly to the patients. Now he can charge for a no-show to Medicare, um, but it's very low, the amount is very low. And uh, there's other patients that can't get in, right? It's not like here where you're just gonna outbid the other person and go down the road and get another position. Um, he was very troubled by this. So these are people that, first off, they're not getting his help, because they probably need it, they got referred to him. And secondly, they're preventing somebody else from not getting the help. So, so that was like, okay, I felt like this is good. He's gotten this off his chest. He's told me a little bit about the frustrations he's experiencing. And, we had actually a pretty good visit, um, a lot of conversation. He, t he showed me around his office and things that he used and didn't use, and I learned a lot about his practice. And then toward the end of the day, uh, we were chatting about a recent disappointment that he had had. Uh, he was planning on creating and leading a new uh, center for patients with this particular condition that he was, a, he was an expert in. And he had secured corporate support to start this. It was gonna be a public-private partnership. And uh, he'd gotten corporate support for the initial startup costs, but then at the last minute, this particular corporation had reorganized and withdrew the money. And he was deeply disappointed. So you can imagine the awkwardness, because guess who sponsored my study? Oh. <laughs> so I am not of the opinion that you should ever lie to your participants, ever. Um, and I always tell them anyway. I mean, I tell them right away, but I always tell them whom I represent. So I told him at this moment. Um, he became visibly upset. Tears actually in his eyes. Um, 
he, he told me this brought up very bad memories for him, and he asked me to leave immediately. So I did. Um, I was extremely uncomfortable. I don't even like talking about this. This bothers me to talk about this because I felt like I'd really crossed over some sort of ethical line, and I'm still not sure what ethical line that was. Um, I immediately got on the phone with my colleague. We had this like impromptu ethical audit. Uh, you know, she talked about the physician that she had seen that day. We compared notes. You know, I was like, no, I don't think I'm really doing anything wrong. He was definitely upset. Did I cause him any harm? I, you know, it was it was it was a discomforting moment. So, it was at this moment that I realized, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to please everybody, and no matter what you're making or what you're doing, you are going to disappoint people. You can't control everything. You're going to fail. Um, I might disappoint that person. My client may disappoint that person. My stakeholder, my partner may disappoint them. We're going to make them unhappy. This is inevitable. You're not going to please everyone. But what I could do in this particular case was commit to telling the story of the failure. I could equip my clients uh, with this uncomfortable knowledge that this physician gave me. And that's exactly what, what I did. And I'll tell you what I did uh, a little bit later. Um, but what I didn't do was shy away from it. And this is the kind of experience that you need to embrace as a builder, as a maker of technology. At the time, I didn't know this, but what I was trying to do was practice um, accompaniment. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is accompaniment and how ethnographic research can actually improve, or it's, it's an ideal way to, to practice accompaniment. Uh, this is especially important in this age of big data and A-B testing, uh, experimentation. Um, Lean UX, anybody? Lean UX, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, yeah, so Michael has, a co everybody should have a copy of this. You should read this, but this is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about A-B testing and experimentation. There is simply no substitute for accompaniment when it comes to building social technology. How do I know this? I know this in part from Dr. Paul Farmer. Anybody know who he is? Yes? Partners. Partners in Health. Partners in Health. He's a Harvard trained physician. He has um, founded the NGO Partners in Health. He has lived and worked in Haiti for the past 25 years. Um, I actually wasn't too surprised to learn that he's also trained as an anthropologist, um, as is the new leader of the World Bank, as a matter of fact. He's a medical anthropologist. Listen to the things he says sometimes. You're like, oh, that makes sense. He gets it. Um, so he uses medical and social science to solve some of the most intractable health problems in the entire world. And let's not mince words. Uh, Haiti is a mess. Cholera, HIV, AIDS trauma, injury, infrastructure failure. There's just far too many problems uh, to count. And even just, just two weeks ago, Medicine Sans Frontières reported that it's five years since that earthquake. Remember the earthquake? Mm -hmm. And still, Haitians are struggling to get clean drinking water and stay uh, away from cholera and TB and to contain them. That earthquake killed 220,000 people, and 10% of the island's medical staff died. Think about that for a second. That's an impossible situation. You cannot fix that. Yet, here's Dr. Paul Farmer, day in, day out, trying to help uh, Haitians. His role is not to heal everyone. He can't do it. It's impossible. Yeah, okay, he's a doctor. Yeah, he can use his medical expertise to bear, he can bring that to bear. He can try to make people healthy. But his role is more important. His role is to be there and to bear witness he is there experiencing his patients' lives right alongside them. He's there telling their stories, listening to their stories and telling their stories. And he helps where he can. But most importantly, his role is simply to be there and pay attention and to consume their experience. This is what uh, he told uh, a former uh, Harvard um, audience. This is when he's explaining the concept of uh, accompaniment. There's an element of mystery, of openness in accompaniment. I'll go with you and support you on your journey, wherever it leads. I'll keep you company, and I will share your fate for a while. And by a while, I don't mean a little while. Accompaniment is much more about sticking with a task until it's deemed complete.
completed by the person or the people being accompanied than by the accompanator. This is quite important. He's pointing out something that we fail to do a lot of times as designers and researchers is we fail to take into account uh, the long time. Now, it's, I'm going to talk about why, why it's difficult to do that in a second, but what, what he's morally committed to is a, the, in, the intention of doing that, of spending time alongside them. And it's them that tells when it's done, not him. And he may, not, he may fail. He may not be able to stay the whole time. He may not stay as long as they need him to, but it's for them that he's there. So he's putting their needs first. I'm going to argue that this is a model we can use as designers of technology. We can accompany our users, both metaphorically and literally, in their journeys using technology. <clears throat> technology is pretty much everywhere uh, in all aspects of social life today. So it's more important than ever that we really begin to feel people's pain. As a matter of fact, okay, so Michael, who's the bookseller out there, I don't know if you guys noticed that he was freaking out over his Samsung Android phone that he just got. Um, he couldn't find how to get to the bar after. He wanted to go to parlor after, right? And he's thought, you know, it's, I'm just maps. Where's maps, right? No maps. Can't find maps. Has to sign in to Google. Doesn't remember his Google account. It became a saga. <laughs> and he, he wanted to hire me as his personal technical assistant, walk him through the whole process. Um, that's, a, that's a little journey that I just took with somebody. And the pain he was experiencing, he just wanted to turn on maps. That's all he wanted. I could have easily said, well, I work for Google, I work for Microsoft, but I'm happy you're having this problem. <laughs> Enjoy it, right? No, I tried to help him through. He made it to the point where he could finally look it up, and he found the directions, and he could get there. And not that it was really important, because it's only a block away. <laughs> but he was experiencing pain, and I was there to experience it alongside him. What is accompaniment? It means being with your stakeholder throughout the journey. And in our case, it means being with the user. And yes, I too use the word user. I don't use the word customer because customer is the person that writes the check. They may not actually use the tool. The user. Sometimes it's the same person. So it's more important for me to consider the user. We cannot solve every user's problem. Realistically, we can't even solve the majority of the problems. We can try. If you work uh, where I work at Microsoft, uh, try solving a billion problems for a billion people. It is what they, what we say, Joe Bellafiore at Microsoft says, is it's like ordering pizza for a billion people. It is like that. So you're going to fail. Forget it, right? You're going to try. It's more important that you try. Like Dr. Farmer, he bears witness to their struggles. And if we commit to accompaniment of our users, we will likely solve a fair number of their problems, and probably the ones that hurt the most. But more importantly, we're never going to focus on perfect designs or the right solution or what I like to call the diva school of design. Uh, we won't have that. Hi. Come on in. <laughs> Just like Dr. Farmer never focuses on obliterating cholera in Haiti, instead he focuses on being there. Uh, we too should focus on being there with that user's pain. And it's hard. Now accompaniment, like I said, is a metaphorical and a literal journey. So there's metaphorical and literal, literal reasons why it's hard. The first is literal, practical. This is actually the one excuse you're going to hear over and over and over again, why accompaniment is so hard. Um, time budget quality, we all know that, right? The, uh, the project management pyramid or a triangle, you can have two. You can't have all three, time, budget, or quality. Something's going to suffer. So oftentimes, you know, you, maybe you don't have the money, maybe the budget isn't there, okay. Maybe you don't have the time, okay. And in the fog of design, we often forget our moral commitment to our users, and that's a practical problem. Yes, it does happen, but it does not explain every single, single instance of why we can't go out and be with people and bear witness to their struggles. It does not explain it. It's hard because empathy is hard. Empathy, according to nursing professor Teresa Wiseman, says it's four things. To be able to understand the world as another person sees it. To be non-judgmental about what you see. To understand another person's feelings. So you, it's not good enough just to bear witness necessarily. You have to understand where they're coming from. And then you have to be able to communicate those feelings to other people. That's really difficult to do. 
Um, now, you know, Dr. Wiseman's coming from the perspective of nursing as a profession. The empathy in nursing is actually a skill, and it's a very emotionally exhausting activity. And she's trying to point out that understanding how another person sees the world, being able to be non-judgmental about that, understanding their feelings and communicating it, that's actually really hard to do. It's a pretty tall order. Uh, many of us here uh, today are probably pretty tech savvy. And chances are we are pretty astounded at the crazy ways that people try to complete even the simplest of tasks. Um, it's really hard not to judge people when you're doing that. It's really hard to see what they're trying to do with our technology that we built and empathize with their views. I know I've seen it over and over again uh, where I've experienced opportunities to new, learn entirely new workarounds, let's put it that way, that I had not thought possible. I'm not that possible. I'm reminded, of, I mean, that this isn't in the course of my research, but whenever I think about the backward technology or the tech neophyte that I'm talking with, I think about when I was in Kiev in 1995 and there was an old Ukrainian man and he was talking on a payphone and he had the cradle of the phone like this, but he had it upside down and he, he was screaming and couldn't understand why nobody could hear him. That's what I think of. I think of that Ukrainian man. He obviously, he'd come in from the village, you know, like he didn't know. He probably barely even knew what a telephone was. So we need to empathize with that. And that's hard if we're really advanced in the technological world. But, you know, probably the most important reason why is because we feel shame. Accompaniment is hard because we feel ashamed of what we've built. I can't be the only one here who has seen your own tools uh, being, you know, used to actually torture users. <laughs> and you don't really know what, you really don't want to be in that moment where you say it. And I actually remember one tool in particular, and it was, um, it was an online conference public uh, paper, paper submission system. And it was, I was, you know, the researcher on the project, and my role was to do, you know, generative research, interview some stakeholders, and then do some usability testing, make sure that it really worked. And, you know, I, it, it really defeated users that were trying to, uh, to use it. And, you know, we, it was too late. We'd already coded, hard coded. This is HTML based. It was like early cloud in a sense, but it was all hard coded, so you'd have to like host it yourself. And so there were a lot of practical reasons why we couldn't fix it. And I felt ashamed that we hadn't fixed even the most basic problems. And I really didn't want to think about how badly I was treating users and how much people struggled. And I would have preferred to never think about it again. And then, of course, one day I actually had to use it as a user. <laughs> and it brought all, I mean, many years later. This is the thing about, you know, you forget this, right? People are using technology that you built like 10 years ago. And you're like, God, that was terrible back then. This is awful, right? And, and I had to use it. And I had to submit my paper. And yes, it was the night before. And yes, there was a deadline. And yes, and yet all of the things that were there, it was still there. So I didn't even want to talk about it. I didn't want to represent it. I didn't push. I didn't insist. I didn't put my hand up and scream. What was going on there? Shame. Shame is what prevents us from accompanying our users through their journeys. Uh, shame researcher Brene Brown actually tells us that shame is triggered when we are confronted with evidence that we are not what we think we are. Now, organizational culture researchers like Kim Cameron tell us that this is the exact mechanism that makes organizations as a whole distort the truth about products they make or services that they provide. It's being confronted with the reality that you are not what you thought, either as an individual or as a company. If we're ashamed of our work individually, maybe we can just avoid talking about it. Maybe you're never going to mention that paper you wrote you know, 1978 or whatever. And maybe you're not going to, oh, maybe everybody will forget that magazine that I worked for in 1992. They won't have a paper version of it. It's gone, right? <laughs> um, but collectively, as a, as a company or an organization, we actively silence people who do talk about the shameful truth. Accompaniment is hard because you need to confront this gap between who you are and who you, what you think you are. And we as individuals have a hard time confronting this, and we as organizations find it almost impossible. Organizations are self-sustaining machines, and they'll stamp out anything that threatens them. That's why accompaniment is hard. Not because it costs too much money, not because it takes too much time. Sometimes that's true. But for the most part, it's hard because it's about shame. Mm -hmm. 
And we need to do it. We need to do this. We need to go out there and we need to be with our participants, our users. Ethnography is ideally suited as a research method to do that. And it differs significantly from many user experience research methods, particularly usability testing, but also A-B testing and other data science. Um, ethnography is ideal for accompaniment because it puts the researcher in the shoes of the user. To do ethnography, you must practice empathy. To do ethnography, you have to grapple with your own sense of shame. To do ethnography, you have to devote time and money to be with your users, to accompany them literally through their journey of opening your new product, trying to sign up, trying to get it started, trying to use it, trying to get rid of it if they don't want it, and then metaphorically just being there with them, having their thoughts and their, their, their statements in your head where they start telling you how difficult it is for them to get this stuff done and how it tortures them and how poor Michael out there was like, I just want to go to the bar. Like, why is this so hard? God. And he actually, interestingly, he's probably going to take that phone back. He's got two days left. He had a, a two-week window. And he's like, I'm taking it back. That's it. I've made up my mind. I'm taking it back. He didn't understand, too, that Android has multiple skins. So he was like, well, this is, this is, Google makes this, right? And I was like, well, yes, but AT&T put all that crap on the phone. And he didn't understand why, and it made no sense. AT&T needs to have some time with him. And so does Google, for that matter. They need to spend some time. When you do ethnography, you can't sit behind a screen and comfortably ignore how horrible your technology is. You can't sit inside a usability lab and be a disembodied voice. Please turn it up. <laughs> um, you can't do that. Ethnography doesn't allow you to do that. And it's amazing how much we forget that with uh, the, I was interesting, I was looking at the labs that our colleague um, uh, Parrish from Ford had. And they have, oh my goodness, do they have labs, right? They have labs for simulating, um, you know, cars. They have an actual car that you can, like, sit in, you know. Um, these are good things to have. I mean, they obviously need them. Life and death are on the line in the case of Ford Interaction Design. But it does, he noticed how he said they could go out into cars. They're on real roads with real people in real cars. The lab can't, can't do that, can't create that experience for you. If you practice ethnography, you can't pretend that you're meeting everybody's needs. You can't control the temperature. <laughs> you can't control the, uh, the, the sheen of the sun on your screen. Uh, you are going to come face to face with that which exactly makes you uncomfortable. And this is why it's ideally suited to accompaniment. Researchers, uh, t they use a term called etic, um, etic research. When we think of survey researchers or data scientists or usability engineers, that what they're practicing is what researchers call etic research. And that which is practiced from the researcher's point of view. So it means that the researcher gets to define the categories of what is important. A data scientist may consider a conversion to be a completion of a registration form, for example. And in what universe does an individual person actually think of signing up for a newsletter as a conversion? <laughs> like, never, right? She doesn't think that. Maybe she thinks it's an act of curiosity. Or maybe it's an act of loyalty. Or maybe it's an act of extortion, which is actually what happened to Michael up here, right? He had to sign in because he couldn't get what he wanted. This is not a conversion. <laughs> this is extortion. But you don't have to do that, think in those terms when you're sitting behind a screen. These categories are defined by the researcher and edit. edit. It is different in ethnography. You actually use the categories that the user might use, which she says is extortion. These are what is important. And it's what we call the emic perspective, or what the participant is telling us. A-B testing, in particular, is etic, and it's how we think about the categories. How we, as researchers, want to think about success. As we, as researchers, want to categorize and consider. And how we, the universe of, of this topic, we decide what that universe is. And if you go outside of that little frame, it's an outlier, or it's irrelevant, or I don't even hear about it because I didn't ask you. Emic, on the other hand, is completely different. Being emic is talking, is taking somebody else's point of view, or as we've said earlier, being empathetic, right? Which is not just like a, a, a fluffy term. Being empathetic is actually a set of skills, <laughs> uh, as I mentioned. 
I, I talk about this idea of being emic in my book. I talk about the user or the customer, or better yet, the person, the person's categories, using their categories instead of my categories. Um, when we do A-B testing or survey research, we're using our categories, we're paying attention to things that we think is important. So, for example, I designed a survey not that long ago, and I used the uh, North America Standard Industrial Codes in uh, the survey. What, you know, and I had to change the names. I, you know what? I couldn't do it. I could not put agriculture, food, blah, blah, blah. I had to say, like, farming. Like, I had to do that, right? Because I knew that the people on the other end didn't think about that. If you ever look at the NAICS codes, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. They're absurd. Try to put yourself in them. You won't, as user experience, actually. It's particularly difficult. So you, when you're being emic, you're using their categories, and you're considering what they think is important. Um, I remember about, uh, about a million years ago, I had a client who was a paper company, a consumer paper company. That's what they call themselves. Household paper. What do you think they made? Toilet paper. Toilet paper, yes. <laughs> toilet paper. They wanted to build an entire online experience for consumers interested in toilet paper. Um, okay, so right off the bat, you can see, I'm going to stop you there. People interested in, in household paper. Okay. Nobody's going to be Googling household paper. Please tell me more. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Um, no one's interested in it. Tell, I'm going to tell you right now. Well, no one but this company, of course. Their actual paychecks relied on toilet paper. Their customers, nope. They didn't spend any time researching, considering, thinking about, talking, discussing, considering toilet paper. They spent zero time on it. You might spend a fraction of the time when you're actually buying it, but chances are you probably buy the same thing over and over again. And if you go to the store and it's not there, you're like, whatever, right? Unless you happen to be like my stepsister, which is probably the only segment that they should have who has a very specific idea of what she wants. We don't know any more why. <laughs> it's been a life. <laughs> she's very interested in the particular quality that she perceives in the toilet paper, but she's probably their dream customer. But everybody else, nobody cares, right? Come on. You could do all the A-B testing in the world, and you would still not truly understand that toilet paper means nothing to people until you spend time from their perspective. You know, you measure how many people sign up for the toilet paper newsletter, and you think, hey, we've got some really good engagement out there. Good conversion rates. No, no, they're not interested. Use the emic position, you will never, ever make that mistake. You can't. People are interested in themselves, their own lives, their own paychecks. You have to pretend that you are them while you're doing it, and you can't pretend otherwise. Ethnography is perfect for this, because you're physically in their location. So how do you do this in design? Design and user experience are disciplines that are hungry for the emic position, and they are perfectly poised to accompany their users through their journey with technology. But there's a lot of work that in design that actually gets in the way of remembering that that's what you're doing. And I would go out and say 98% of design work involves no direct contact with users. That's charitable. You could even go as high as 99.5, maybe. You can actually practice design and have never visited with a person who is actually using your product in front of you. That's possible. Um, now, going out and seeing somebody use your product in front of you, I wouldn't call that ethnography per se, but it is a start, right? Given that we spend so little time with people directly, how can we actually accompany them? Metaphorically, literally. How do we get honest about our shame? How do we do that? How do we remember them in our, daily, our everyday work? What do we need to do? Um, you commit. If you've ever been to a yoga class, and I personally find it really enjoyable when you get a super new agey instructor who says really crazy things. Um, like, I actually had one who said, you are the sacred sword. Be a sacred sword. And I made sense at the time. It was awesome. <laughs> at the beginning of a class, you often hear them say, now we're going to set our intention. Let's set our intention for the class. And you're basically doing that when you commit to the user's journey. So that means you're, from the very beginning, you're committing to being with them on their path. And what you see here is actual designers sketching out a user's journey. Now, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's not exactly right. It matters that they're committing to doing it at the beginning of the process. It's a way for them to set their intention to feel the user's pain. 
It should be an unvarnished, accurate description of what the user is trying to do and the frustration that they feel. That's probably the most important thing. The details are not exactly important. The emotional experience is. Accept it. Accept that they're going to do something that's going to upset them with your product. Try to fix it if you can. Set that intention as a group, as a group together at the beginning. And if you realize you don't even know what the user's journey is, boom, that's a big red flag. <laughs> Really, what do they do when they start using our new product? Maybe we should find that out. Set your attention, commit to the user's journey. And when you're in the field, um, you can actually enact the process, the, the spirit of accompaniment. Um, that means that you're not directing, you're not controlling, you're not pitching, which is something that you see a lot in a lean UX kind of way. There's a, there's a demo, there's no demoing in accompaniment. You're not demoing anything. They're using something and you happen to be there. They've given you permission to watch it. You can see this participant here. She is in her, her home office, which is her kitchen. Uh, and she's got, she doesn't like where her laptop sits, so she puts it on a, a cheesecake tray. That's not a demo, that's not a pitch. This is me watching her. She's also using Windows XP, which I was like, really? Wow. And this is her Blackberry her work issued Blackberry. Wow. I mean, she's got some old, this is not old, this is like 18 months old, this picture. So you're just being with them. You're not like, oh my God, I can't believe you don't have Windows 7 at very least. You're not saying that. You're just recording, you're just being there. And after all, you know, ethnography has been described by an ethnographer as a series of friendly conversations. It's not an interrogation. Uh, it's a series of friendly conversations. And you try to guide it as much as you can. You are acting like a guest. And I talk a lot about this in my book. The idea of being a guest, all the same things apply, and it's really good practice for you when you're designing stuff. Spending time attending to things the host considers important. Um, you, can, you can totally avoid all of that if you go into a lab. You will never know what they consider to be important in their home, which tells you something about their mindset or their office, for example. Like if you have to swipe your badge or their badge to get in or you can't get in, you have to have a sticker. Um, I went to an unnamed financial institution and I went to the lobby to check in to meet my participant and only to find out actually that was the fake lobby. That's like the early lobby. You go upstairs and then there's the real lobby. So you would never know this until you go inside. I was like, that's really interesting. The real lobby is much nicer. But you only get, you, you cannot go up to the real lobby unless somebody brings you. You can't even see it. You don't even know it's there. So you need to learn these things by being there. Um, find out as a guest, what do they consider to be important? Uh, and you know, and that means being like very polite. I had one person tell me Obama is the Antichrist. <laughs> I had another person tell me that the biggest problem that keeps him up at night, and I left that open. I said, what keeps you up at night, period, nothing else, right? And he said, minimum wage. And I said, really, why would minimum wage be keeping you up at night? He said, because my kids can't get a job because these people are too greedy and too entitled to ask for $15 an hour. <sighs> because my kids in high school can't get a job. And I was like, okay, I don't even know where to begin with this one. This is a really tough one, but okay, that was really interesting. I learned something. I just accompanied him. I did not educate him. So when you're out in the field, you can't reject participants. You can't say, you know what, you don't actually fit. I don't like you. Yeah, no, you have to be there. You're, you're in it now. You have to spend time with them. You have to be their guest, and you have to just be there with them, bear witness to what they're doing. Um, one of the main things that you got to do is grapple with this idea of shame. And this is Philip Hunter, some of you may know him. Uh, he's a former colleague, he works at Amazon now. He and Al Youngblood have a little thing they've been cooking up, which is kind of interesting. You might have seen their presentation at uh, World Usability Day. Um, they have been working on a method for showing how people feel about user, user experiences. And they've metricized it, metricized it, <laughs> operationalized it in a way that actively resists uh, numbers. And it's hard to avoid feeling shame when you see words like, uh, oh, these are all the good ones, I didn't get the bad ones, but all the bad words, right? When you don't see the bad words, you know, if you see bad words, it's hard for you to accept it. Uh, people would like to say, oh, cold, hard facts. No, give me cold, hard adjectives, mm -hmm. and then you cannot avoid it. Um, they notice, they, they argue that this notion of qualia is something that we can't interpret, and it's a great way to stay true to what they were actually experiencing. Avoid the metrics, at all, if at all possible, avoid numbers, because we know 
why that happens. People privilege numbers over experiences, but we are not in the numbers business. We're in the experiences business. So we, we, need to, we need to kind of pay attention to what people are feeling and we need to confront it. And we're having a really hard time these days. I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a really hard time confronting big data. I'm having a hard time telling people that numbers don't tell you what you need to know to design mm -hmm. something. And I'm having a really hard time working in the design area because it's all about this lean UX kind of A-B testing kind of experience. So one person who really thought that this was a terrible idea, um, this is Christian Madsen. He was a keynote speaker at Epic in uh, New York. He's the principal at um, Red Associates in Copenhagen. And he argued we should divorce design. Like research should just say, you know what, I'm not in new business anymore. You guys don't listen. You, you go ahead and you do whatever you do, and you don't spend any time thinking about what users actually have. So forget it. We're done, right? I don't think we should go that far. He was, it was, I think he was being provocative. I know he was being provocative. I don't think we should divorce design. We should spend time telling the truth and confronting shame. But I think what we really should be doing with, when we are in design is we need to, uh, researchers need to own design. They need to say, we built this. I Notice how I said that, even though I physically haven't built. Actually, there's a few things I have built. But for the most part these days, I specialize in the research side. So I don't actually put pen to paper. I don't write code. But I designed it. I own that. That's mine, too. And the designer sometimes likes to say, well, you know, I didn't code it. Right? That's, you know, that's somebody else did that. The devs made those decisions, right? No, we all own it. We all own it, and we need to continue our relationship, even if it's a troublesome little marriage even if it's a tough marriage, one that makes it difficult. Uh, you remember what I told you about the physician at the beginning? Mm -hmm. So what I did for him, I had to tell his story. So I told this, his story to my immediate client, the main stakeholder, and I told her uh, what had happened. And she knew about the, the restructuring, and she knew that it had had some impacts um, on individual physicians. And she, she didn't know this particular story, but it didn't really surprise her. She kind of knew that that was happening wasn't the focus of the study, um, and it really didn't have a recommendation at the end of it, but I told the story and she remembered we had a conversation, we agreed that this is like a, this is a problem that we were going to have to address. So then became the big readout for the, the, you know, the wider group, and I told the story again. And there wasn't happy faces, <laughs> there were a few. I didn't spend a lot of time on the story, I'll be honest with you. but. She told me later that it did bring back the moment when they remembered when that restructuring had happened and it had a lot of problems. And they remembered it and they go, damn it, that's just one more data point, one more piece of evidence, one more bad story. I knew that was a terrible cho choice. Mm -hmm. And they remembered it. I didn't fix it for him. He doesn't get he doesn't have a center now. It, like nobody gave him money. Like he never called me back. <laughs> like that never happened. But I did tell the story and I did remind people I bear witness to it. I accompanied. And it's tempting for us to just push these things under the rug, but as soon as we get honest and confront our individual and collective shame, it's very hard to do that. Thank you. I never just produce a document. I will always do a document at the very minimum. Um, I often produce a document. I'll produce a video um, or pieces of video. I'll produce, uh, usually what would happen, I think the minimum normally is a, is a document, a Word document, and then a PowerPoint that has video embedded in it. Uh, and then the document is the handout. It's like, here's more information. Sometimes I'll go to great lengths. Uh, like I did a comic book in that physician case. I, I did a comic book. Um, which was hugely popular, I have to say. By the way, the comic book was major popular. Everybody wanted one. I was really surprised. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun actually. I didn't draw it. I directed the drawing. But so yeah, you have to make it real. So just a document is not really enough. Right. And you're a consultant. Right? Actually, no, no longer. No I work for Microsoft okay. now. For Microsoft. Yeah. Okay. So I, I wonder. I mean, I don't know how long they 
you know, the, that picture reminds me of the horse was dying. So it's uh, how much of that are they going to be incorporating? How much of which? Um, I, I don't know what the integration is with the team. But like the oh, I, I can tell you what I do. I mean, I work I work in a very large design team. We're on actually we're one of the largest design teams I've ever seen. This I just joined this new team, and so I work with basically three different development groups working on designing different things, different feature sites. So I do research. Um, I bring them along with me as much as possible. Yeah, okay. yeah, they come with me. Um, and when they can't come with me, I do videos, I tell stories, I do design thinking workshops, I activate it in a way that makes it alive and really hard for them to ignore. I, the video is really, I, I, I have mixed feelings about video. Um, it's super powerful, but it's also a crutch. So if you just take video as like your solution for doing this, it's probably not a good solution. If you take video as an opportunity to bring forth really cringe-worthy moments, I recommend it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Is there a negative bias in what you do? A negative bias? Well, you're like if you're doing a company, you're always looking for cringe-worthy stuff. No, not necessarily. Some of it's joyful and beautiful, and I can give you an amazing example. Um, I did another project where I was training salespeople on ethnographic methods so that they could be better salespeople. And what we did was we'd go to these public places and like tourist attractions basically and we'd get them to start asking people questions about their experience and observing the experience. Like, oh, it's not wheelchair accessible or whatever. Um, very safe. It's surprising how few salespeople were actually comfortable with this. Their salespeople could be able to do it, but they were very antsy. So one of the places that we went to was in Boston, it was in Fennel Hall. And if you've ever been there, it's one of the places where the tea party started, or the original tea party, the Boston Tea Party started. Um, so I did the first day with a bunch of people, and then we went back for the second day with a different bunch of people, and we couldn't get in. And I was like, oh no, oh no, we're in trouble now. We're totally in trouble. And all these people started coming out of the Vano Hall, and I was like, well, go ask them what's going on, go ask them what's going on. So these, these salespeople started talking to people there. There had been a citizenship ceremony coming out. So there was like a Tibetan grandmother with her like US citizenship and a bunch of brand new Americans coming out. And I'm Canadian and I found this affecting because I, I don't feel American. And that felt, and what was really felt American, there was this other guy there, some young kind of frat boy kind of guy. And they started talking to him. He's like, I just came down to get some chowder. And I was like, oh, yeah, I should say that. And he's like, oh, okay. He goes, yeah, my buddy brought me down because I just came back from Iraq. And I just got discharged, and he's watching this, and he's crying. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of accompaniment. I get to tell that story, the joyful story. I think I understand a little bit about what it means to be American because I saw that. So it doesn't have to be negative. I think we should call. Yeah, it's probably. I will stay. I will. Not, I will okay, you'll just have. Well, thank you so much.